The future of our church and the future of this island of Ireland depends on our integrity. In 100 years' time, are we going to prove that no good thing can be made out of the crooked timber of humanity? Or are we going to take that same wood and turn it into an oak of righteousness? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus describes the seven woes of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, and he rebukes them for being like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but inside full of dead men's bones. And in reflecting on the last 100 years of the church in Ireland, we cannot ignore the reality that many people think the church, like the Pharisees, is full of hypocrites. In the last two years, my legal research has looked at the response to child sexual abuse in the Roman Catholic Church across 10 different countries. And the Irish Church in particular does not have a credible voice on the issues that dominate Irish society, in part because it refuses to acknowledge its role and responsibility for this abuse and its cover-up, but more fundamentally because it is not seen to practice what it preaches. A harsh, traditional approach to sexual ethics masked a litany of abominable sexual violence. Institutions intended to protect the most vulnerable in society exploited and abused women and children. And we know the result. Thousands have walked away from the church. The dedication and the sacrifice of generations of Irish men and women in vocations risks being forgotten. Trust in church remains broken. Our public figures fare no better. We can criticize banks for preaching a property boom while practicing a bust. We can criticize successive governments for subjecting the most vulnerable to austerity while helping the most powerful corporations pay the smallest of tax bills. And we can criticize Western leadership in general for preaching human rights equality and free trade for all while selling weapons to warlords and plundering the planet. The sacrifice of successive generations from 1916 for basic rights and freedoms risks being corrupted further. Trust in government, in power, and in institutions is broken too. It's very easy to point fingers, isn't it? And from here, it's very fun. <laughs> but what about you and I? On serious issues that dominate our society, do we walk the walk, or do we just talk the talk? So I research and teach law for a living. And when I try to help students understand how to engage in serious legal, moral, uh, or political debates, I tell them this. When you think about the harm that someone has suffered or the abuse or the trauma they've gone through, you will have a gut reaction. Some of us will want to forget. The issue is too upsetting or too complex to understand, so we forget. Others will want vengeance and retribution for the perpetrators of the harm and others still will want to rehabilitate and repair those who have suffered. Your gut will inevitably react to the provocative issues of our day. It is good and healthy, but it is a crappy basis for making policy because our gut doesn't take into account the views of others. Victims of crime, victims of the troubles, victims of child sexual abuse, all disagree about what is right and what should be done in their context. Beyond harm, political factions disagree about what is best for our country. And I've even heard a rumor that Christians disagree about what their faith means and what the Bible means. <laughs> so my question today is how do we practice our disagreement? What does it look like? Our recent referendum on marriage equality showed both the potential and the risk for church and state in engaging in public debate. We had arguments from equality, from fairness, from the golden rule, used by both sides to support their arguments. But we also had personal attacks, threats of violence, spurious moral and legal arguments, and shallow and narrow references to scripture. In the next 100 years, I submit to you, our disagreements will not go away. The legacy of the troubles, questions of abortion, of assisted dying and assisted reproduction, the role of faith in schools are all ongoing challenges and controversies. There is a risk that how we practice ourselves in these diverse disagreements and contexts is not united in love, but in hostility and hypocrisy. 
But I believe and, and want to submit an idea today that there is the potential for how we engage in these disagreements to redeem the failures of our past and to move us further along the arc of history towards justice. My suggestion today is that therefore we need to practice integrity in our values and our actions. And the late Ronald Dworkin, a professor of mine in New York, described integrity uh, as follows. If I am faced with someone who holds moral opinions radically different from my own, I cannot count on finding anything in my set of reasons and arguments that he should accept. I cannot demonstrate to him that my opinions are true and his are false, but I can hope to convince him and myself of something else more important, that I have acted responsibly in reaching my opinions and acting upon them. And so he concludes, we are responsible to the degree that our interpretations achieve an overall integrity so that each supports the others in a network of value that we embrace. So integrity therefore calls us to co present our values honestly and as interconnected. How do my views on grace relate to my views on government? How do my practices with the poor relate to my practices with forgiveness? How do my views of scripture justifying the role of women in church leadership relate to my views of gay and lesbian Christians? Integrity then also calls us to go past the substance of these divisive topics to encourage and to challenge ourselves to honor our words, our stated commitments to one another, and to recognize the need not to score cheap points, but to respond to the best version of one another's values. Think for a moment of a person you can't stand. Be honest with yourself. A person whose views you think are dangerous or outdated or heretical. They don't think they're a bad person or a hypocrite. They think they're right. And I believe we are more likely to achieve cooperation with one another, more likely to do love and justice when we learn to hold our values lightly and with open hands in conversation. As Brian said, the beautiful pose uh, of Jesus on the cross. And when we take the grown-up step to admit that I might be wrong and that I might be able to learn from rather than compete with someone else with whom I disagree. So what does integrity look like, not just in general, but for a Christian? It looks like love. It looks beautiful. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells us the greatest of the commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. And it is against this love, the love demonstrated to us by Jesus, that we should assess our views and practices as Christian people and communities. We must honor the word love. Now, a cynic will quickly reply that, well, Christians already disagree about what love means. If they disagree about how to love those who are different and how to read their Bibles, they cannot practice integrity. So some things are clear. None of the debates in Christianity will be easy or straightforward. But I submit to you, other things are clear too. It is clear to me that God's sacrificial love on the cross behind me is big enough to embrace our disagreements and strong enough to encourage us to be better than our hypocrisy. It is clear to me that while Christians are called to live in unity, that does not mean uniformity, for we are one body with many members. And when we say as Christians that there is no shame or condemnation in Jesus, we need to mean it and practice it, and not just for those who already agree with us. Fundamentally, integrity therefore calls us to practice what we preach vigorously, and not just when it benefits us or costs us nothing. So today I want to call out myself, and I want to call out uh, our church in Ireland. Have we focused on being right rather than being radically loving? I love being right. I am an academic. It's my job. And I'm a nerd in my spare time. But I want to repent of that because I love the way shown to me by Jesus more. I want not to exclude where I can welcome, not to judge where I can show mercy, not to show indifference where I can practice love. When we disagree as Christians, you and I, do we walk in a manner worthy of our calling? Do we bear patiently with one another in love? 
And when the structural church, when our institutions engage in the public square, do they get out of the business of power, of defensiveness, of shaming and control? And do they immerse themselves in proclaiming good news to the poor, binding up the brokenhearted, proclaiming freedom to captives and comfort to those who mourn? Can we call our church with a straight face an oak of righteousness? To conclude today, I want to submit to you that when we hear society calling us out and questioning us on whether we love well, we should welcome these questions if we claim to be in the Jesus business. And so to conclude, my prayer for the next 100 years of the church in Ireland on this beautiful broken island is that we will show a society alive with debate, rich with the practice of integrity, with the honoring and dignifying of one another, and that we may be a church that remembers the goodness and redeems the crookedness of our past and walks in the way of Jesus always. Thank you very much.